Chapter 36 of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. North and South by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter 36 Union Not Always Strength. The steps of the bearers, heavy and slow, the sobs of the mourners, deep and low. Shelley. At the time arranged the previous day, they set out on their walk to see Nicholas Higgins and his daughter. They both were reminded of their recent loss, by a strange kind of shyness in their new habiliments, and in the fact that it was the first time, for many weeks, that they had deliberately gone out together. They drew very close to each other in unspoken sympathy. Nicholas was sitting by the fireside in his accustomed corner, but he had not his accustomed pipe. He was leaning his head upon his hand, his arm resting on his knee. He did not get up when he saw them, though Margaret could read the welcome in his eye. "'Sit ye down, sit ye down, fire's welly out,' said he, giving a vigorous poke as if to turn attention away from himself. He was rather disorderly, to be sure, with a black unshaven beard of several days' growth, making his pale face look yet paler, and a jacket which would have been all the better for patching. "'We thought we should have a good chance of finding you just after dinner-time,' said Margaret. "'We have had our sorrow, too, since we saw you,' said Mr. Hale. "'Aye, aye. Sorrows is more plentiful than dinners just now.' I reckon my dinner hour stretches all o'er the day. You're pretty sure of finding me. Are you out of work? asked Margaret. Aye, he replied shortly. Then, after a moment's silence, he added, looking up for the first time, I'm not wanting brass, don't you think it? Bess, poor lass, had a little stock under her pillow, ready to slip into my hand last moment, and Mary is fustian cutting, but I'm out of work all the same. "'We owe Mary some money,' said Mr. Hale, before Margaret's sharp pressure on his arm could arrest the words. "'If who takes it, I'll turn her out of doors. I'll bide inside these four walls, and she'll bide out. That's aught. "'But we owe her many thanks for her kind service,' began Mr. Hale again. "'I ne'er thanked your daughter there for her deeds of love to my poor wench. I ne'er could find the words.' I's have to begin and try now, if you start making an ado about what little Mary could sarve you. Is it because of the strike you're out of work? asked Margaret gently. Strike's ended. It's o'er for this time. I'm out of work because I ne'er ask for it, and I ne'er ask for it because good words it's scarce, and bad words is plentiful. He was in a mood to take a surly pleasure in giving answers that were like riddles, but Margaret saw that he would like to be asked for the explanation. And good words are asking for work. I reckon them's almost the best words that men can say. Give me work means, and I'll do it like a man. Them's good words. And bad words are refusing you work when you ask for it? Aye. Bad words is saying, Aha, my fine chap, you have been true to your order, and I'll be true to mine. You did the best you could for them as wanted help. That's your way of being true to your kind, and I'll be true to mine. You have been a poor fool, as knowed no better, nor be a true faithful fool. So go and be damned to you. There's no work for you here. Them's bad words. I'm not a fool, and if I was, folk ought to have taught me how to be wise after their fashion. I could map and have learnt, if any one had tried to teach me. Would it not be worth while, said Mr. Hale, to ask your old master if he would take you back again? It might be a poor chance, but it would be a chance. He looked up again with a sharp glance at the questioner, and then tittered a low and bitter laugh. Master, if it's no offense, I'll ask you a question or two in my turn. You're quite welcome, said Mr. Hale. I reckon you own some way of earning your bread. Folks seldom lives in Milton less for pleasure if they can live anywhere else. You are quite right. I have some independent property. But my intention in settling in Milton was to become a private tutor. To teach folk. Well, I reckon they pay you for teaching them, do not they? Yes, replied Mr. Hill, smiling. I teach in order to get paid. And then that pays you. 
Then they tell you what n to do, or what n not to do with the money they gives you in just payment for your pains, in fair exchange like. No, to be sure not. They do not say, Yo may have a brother or a friend as dear as a brother who wants this here brass for a purpose both yo and he think right, but yo mun promise not to give it to him. Yo may see a good use as you think to put your money to, but we don't think it good, and so if you spend it, uh, that uns will just leave off dealing with you. They do not say that, don't they? No, to be sure not. Would yo stand it if they did? It would be some very hard pressure that would make me even think of submitting to such dictation. There is not the pressure on all the broad earth that would make me, said Nicholas Higgins. Now you've got it. You've hit the bull's eye. Hampers, that's where I worked, makes their men pledge themselves they'll not give a penny to help the union or keep turnouts from clemming. They may pledge and make pledge, continued he scornfully. They know but make liars and hypocrites. And that's a less sin to my mind to making men's hearts so hard that they'll not do a kindness to them as needs it, or help on the right and just cause, though it goes against the strong hand. But I'll ne'er forswear myself for the work the king could give me. I'm a member of the Union, and I think it's the only thing to do the workmen any good. And I've been a turnout, and known what it were to Clem, so if I get a shilling, sixpence shall go to them if they ax it from me. Consequence is, I don't see where I'm to get a shilling. Is that rule about not contributing to the Union in force at all the mills? asked Margaret. I cannot say. It's a new regulation at Ourn, and I reckon they'll find that they cannot stick to it. But it's in force now. By and by they'll find out. Tyrants makes liars. There was a little pause. Margaret was hesitating whether she should say what was in her mind. She was unwilling to irritate one who was already gloomy and despondent enough. At last out it came, but in her soft tones and with her reluctant manner, showing that she was unwilling to say anything unpleasant, it did not seem to annoy Higgins, only to perplex him. Do you remember poor Boucher saying that the Union was a tyrant? I think he said it was the worst tyrant of all, and I remember at the time I agreed with him. It was a long while before he spoke. He was resting his head on his two hands and looking down into the fire, so she could not read the expression on his face. I'll not deny but what the Union finds it necessary to force a man into his own good. I'll speak truth. A man leads a dree life who's not in the Union. But once in the Union, his interests are taken care on better nor he could do it for himself, or by himself, for that matter. It's the only way working men can get their rights by all joining together. More the members, more chance for each one separate man having justice done him. Government takes care of fools and madmen, and if any man is inclined to do himself or his neighbor a hurt, it puts a bit of a check on him, whether he likes it or no. That's all we do in the Union. We can't clap folk into prison, but we can make a man's life so heavy to be born that he's obliged to come in and be wise and helpful in spite of himself. Boucher were a fool all along, and ne'er a worse fool than at the last. He did you harm? asked Margaret. Aye, that did he. We had public opinion on our side till he and his sort began rioting and breaking laws. It were all o'er with the strike then. Then would it not have been far better to have left him alone and not forced him to join the Union? He did you no good, and you drove him mad. Margaret, said her father in a low and warning tone, for he saw the cloud gathering on Higgins's face. I like her, said Higgins suddenly. Who speaks plain out what's in her mind? Who doesn't comprehend the Union for all that? It's a great power. It's our only power. I have read a bit of poetry about a plough going o'er a daisy, as made tears come into my eyes afore I'd other cause for crying. But the chap ne'er stopped driving the plough, I's warrant, for all he were pitiful about the daisy. He too much mother wit for that. The Union's the plough, making ready the land for harvest time. Such as Boucher, t'would be setting him up too much to liken him to a daisy. He's like her a weed lounging over the ground. Mun just make up their mind to be put out the way. I'm sore vexed with him just now, so Map and I do not speak him fair. I could go o'er him with a plough myself, whether the pleasure in life. Why, what has he been doing? Anything fresh? Aye, to be sure. He's ne'er out of mischief, that man. 
First of all, he must go raging like a mad fool and kick up yon riot. Then he'd to go into hiding, where he'd have been yet if Thornton had followed him out as I'd hoped he would have done. But Thornton, having got his own purpose, didn't care to go on with the prosecution for the riot. So Boucher slunk back again to his house. He ne'er showed himself abroad for a day or two. He had that grace. And then, where think ye that he went? Why to hampers? Damn him. He went with his mealy-mouthed face, that turns me sick to look at, asking for work, though he knowed well enough the new rule of pledging themselves to give not to the unions, not to help the starving turnout. Why, he'd a clem to death if the union hadn't helped him in his pinch. There he went, ossing to promise aught and pledge himself to aught, to tell aw he knowed on our proceedings, the good-for-nothing Judas. But I'll say this for Hamper, and thank him for it at my dying day. He drove Boucher away, and wouldn't a listen to him, near a word, though folk standing by, says the traitor cried like a baby. Oh, how shocking! How pitiful! exclaimed Margaret. Higgins, I don't know you to-day. Don't you see how you've made Boucher what he is, by driving him into the union against his will, without his heart going with it? You have made him what he is. Made him what he is? What was he? Gathering, gathering along the narrow street, came a hollow, measured sound, now forcing itself on their attention. Many voices were hushed and low, many steps were heard not moving onwards, at least not with any rapidity or steadiness of motion, but as if circling round one spot. Yes, there was one distinct slow tramp of feet which made itself a clear path through the air and reached their ears. The measured labored walk of men carrying a heavy burden. They were all drawn towards the house door by some irresistible impulse. Impelled thither, not by a poor curiosity, but as if by some solemn blast. Six men walked in the middle of the road, three of them being policemen. They carried a door, taken off its hinges, upon their shoulders, on which lay some dead human creature, and from each side of the door there were constant droppings. All the street turned out to see, and seeing, to accompany the procession, each one questioning the bearers, who answered almost reluctantly at last, so often had they told the tale. We found him in the brook in the field beyond there. The brook? Why, there's not water enough to drown him. He was a determined chap. He lay with his face downwards. He was sick enough a living. Choose what cause he had for it. Higgins crept up to Margaret's side and said in a weak, piping kind of voice, It's not John Boucher. He hadn't a spunk enough. Sure. It's not John Boucher. Why, they are looking this way. Listen. I have a singing in my head, and I cannot hear. They put the door down carefully upon the stones, and all might see the poor drowned wretch, his glassy eyes, one half open, staring right upwards to the sky. Owing to the position in which he had been found lying, his face was swollen and discolored besides. His skin was stained by the water in the brook, which had been used for dying purposes. The fore part of his head was bald, but the hair grew thin and long behind, and every separate lock was a conduit for water. Through all these disfigurements, Margaret recognized John Boucher. It seemed to her so sacrilegious to be peering into that poor, distorted, agonized face, that by a flash of instinct she went forwards and softly covered the dead man's countenance with her handkerchief. The eyes that saw her do this followed her, as she turned away from her pious office, and were thus led to the place where Nicholas Higgins stood, like one rooted to the spot. The men spoke together, and then one of them came up to Higgins, who would have fain shrunk back into his house. Higgins, thou knowed him. Thou mun go tell the wife. Do it gently, man, but do it quick, for we cannot leave him here long. I cannot go, said Higgins. Do not ask me. I cannot face her. Thou knows her best, said the man. When done deal in bringing him here, thou take thy share. I canna do it, said Higgins. I'm willy felled with seeing him. We wasn't friends, and now he's dead. Well, if thou want it, thou want it. Someone mun, though. It's a dree task, but it's a chance every minute, and she doesn't hear on it in some rougher way, nor a person going to make her let on by degrees, as it were. Papa, do you go, said Margaret in a low voice. If I could, if I had time to think of what I had better say, but all at once, Margaret saw that her father was indeed unable. He was trembling from head to foot. I will go, said she. 
Bless you, miss, it will be a kind act, for she's been but a sickly sort of body, I hear, and few hereabouts know much on her. Margaret knocked at the closed door, but there was such a noise, as of many little ill-ordered children, that she could hear no reply. Indeed, she doubted if she was heard, and as every moment of delay made her recoil from her task more and more, she opened the door and went in, shutting it after her, and even, unseen to the woman, fastening the bolt. Mrs. Boucher was sitting in a rocking chair on the other side of the ill-read-up fireplace. It looked as if the house had been untouched for days by any effort at cleanliness. Margaret said something, she hardly knew what. Her throat and mouth were so dry, and the children's noise completely prevented her from being heard. She tried again. "'How are you, Mrs. Boucher? But very poorly, I'm afraid.' "'I've no chance of being well,' said she, querulously. "'I'm left alone to manage these children, and not for to give em for to keep em quiet. John shouldn't have left me, and me so poorly. "'How long is it since he went away?' Four days sin. No one would give him work here, and he'd to go on tramp toward Greenfield. But he might have been back afore this, or sent me some word if he'd gotten work. He might— Oh, don't blame him, said Margaret. He felt it deeply, I'm sure. Will, too, hold thy den and let me hear the lady speak, addressing herself in no very gentle voice to a little urchin of about a year old. She apologetically continued to Margaret. He's always mithering me for Daddy and Buddy, and I had no buddies to give him, and Daddy's away and forgotten his awe, I think. He's his father's darling, he is, said she, with a sudden turn of mood, and dragging the child up to her knee, she began kissing it fondly. Margaret laid her hand on the woman's arm to arrest her attention. Their eyes met. Poor little fellow, said Margaret, slowly. He was his father's darling. He is his father's darling, said the woman, rising hastily, and standing face to face with Margaret. Neither of them spoke for a moment or two. Then Mrs. Boucher began in a low, growling tone, gathering in wildness as she went on. He is his father's darling, I say. Poor folk can love their children as well as rich. Why don't you speak? Why don't you stare at me with your great pitiful eyes? Where's John? Weak as she was, she shook Margaret to force out an answer. "'Oh, my God,' said she, understanding the meaning of that tearful look. She sank back into the chair. Margaret took up the child and put him into her arms. "'He loved him,' said she. "'Aye,' said the woman, shaking her head. "'He loved us all. We had someone to love us once. It's a long time ago, but when he were in life and with us, he did love us. He did. He loved this babby map in the best on us, but he loved me and I loved him, though I was calling him five minutes agone.' "'Are you sure he's dead?' said she, trying to get up. "'If it's only that he's ill and like to die, they may bring him round yet. "'I'm but an ailing creature myself. I've been ailing this long time.' "'But he is dead. He is drowned.' "'Folks are brought round after they're dead drowned. "'What was I thinking of to sit still when I should be stirring myself? "'Here, whist thee, child, whist thee. "'Take this, take aught to play with, but do not cry while my heart's breaking.' Oh, where is my strength gone to? Oh, John, husband. Margaret saved her from falling by catching her in her arms. She sat down in the rocking chair and held the woman upon her knees, her head laying on Margaret's shoulder. The other children, clustered together in a fright, began to understand the mystery of the scene. But the ideas came slowly, for their brains were dull and languid of perception. They set up such a cry of despair as they guessed the truth that Margaret knew not how to bear it. Johnny's cry was loudest of them all, though he knew not why he cried, poor little fellow. The mother quivered as she lay in Margaret's arms. Margaret heard a noise at the door. "'Open it, open it quick,' said she to the eldest child. "'It's bolted. Make no noise. Be very still. Oh, papa, let them go upstairs very softly and carefully, and perhaps she will not hear them.' She has fainted, that's all. It's as well for her, poor creature, said a woman, following in the wake of the bearers of the dead. But you're not fit to hold her. Stay, I'll run fetch a pillow, and we'll let her down easy on the floor. This helpful neighbor was a great relief to Margaret. She was evidently a stranger to the house, a newcomer in the district, indeed. But she was so kind and thoughtful that Margaret felt she was no longer needed and that it would be better, perhaps, to set an example of clearing the house, which was filled with idle, if sympathizing, gazers. 
She looked round for Nicholas Higgins. He was not there. So she spoke to the woman who had taken the lead in placing Mrs. Boucher on the floor. "'Can you give all these people a hint that they had better leave in quietness, so that when she comes round she should only find one or two that she knows about her? Papa, will you speak to the men and get them to go away? She cannot breathe, poor thing, with this crowd about her.' Margaret was kneeling down by Mrs. Boucher and bathing her face with vinegar, but in a few minutes she was surprised at the gush of fresh air. She looked round and saw a smile pass between her father and the woman. "'What is it?' asked she. "'Only our good friend here,' replied her father, "'hit on a capital expedient for clearing the place. "'I bid him be gone and each take a child with him, "'and to mind that they were orphans and their mother a widow. "'It was who could do most, "'and the children are sure of a bellyful today "'and of kindness too. "'Those who know how he died.' "'No,' said Margaret, "'I could not tell her all at once.' "'Who mun be told because of the inquest? "'See, who's coming round?' Shall you or I do it, or map and your father would be best? No, you, you, said Margaret. They awaited her perfect recovery in silence. Then the neighbor woman sat down on the floor and took Mrs. Boucher's head and shoulders on her lap. Neighbor, said she, your man is dead. Guess you how he died? He were drowned, said Mrs. Boucher, feebly, beginning to cry for the first time at this rough probing of her sorrows. He were found drowned. He were coming home very hopeless o' aught on earth. He thought God couldna be harder than men, mappin not so hard, mappin as tender as a mother, mappin tenderer. I'm not saying he did right, and I'm not saying he did wrong. All I say is, may neither me nor mine ever have his sore heart, or we may do like things. He has left me alone with all these children, moaned the widow, less distressed at the manner of the death than Margaret expected but it was of a piece with her helpless character to feel his loss as principally affecting herself and her children. "'Not alone,' said Mr. Hill solemnly. "'Who is with you? Who will take up your cause?' The widow opened her eyes wide and looked at the new speaker of whose presence she had not been aware till then. "'Who has promised to be a father to the fatherless?' continued he. "'But I've gotten six children, sir, and the eldest not eight years of age. I'm not meaning for to doubt his power, sir.' only it needs a deal of trust, and she began to cry afresh. Who'll be better able to talk to-morrow, sir, said the neighbor. Best comfort now would be the feel of a child at her heart. I'm sorry they took the babby. I'll go for it, said Margaret, and in a few minutes she returned, carrying Johnny, his face all smeared with eating and his hands loaded with treasures in the shape of shells and bits of crystal and the head of a plaster figure. She placed him in his mother's arms. There, said the woman, now you go. They'll cry together and comfort together, better nor any one but a child can do. I'll stop with her as long as I'm needed, and if you come to-morrow, you can have a deal of wise talk with her that she's not up to to-day. As Margaret and her father went slowly up the street, she paused at Higgins's closed door. Shall we go in? asked her father. I was thinking of him, too. They knocked. There was no answer, so they tried the door. It was bolted, but they thought they heard him moving within. Nicholas, said Margaret. There was no answer, and they might have gone away, believing the house to be empty, if there had not been some accidental fall, as of a book within. Nicholas, said Margaret again, it is only us. Won't you let us come in? No, said he. I spoke as plain as I could about using words when I bolted the door. Let me be this day. Mr. Hale would have urged their desire, but Margaret placed her finger on his lips. "'I don't wonder at it,' said she. "'I myself long to be alone. It seems the only thing to do one good after a day like this.'" End of chapter 36 Recording by Leanne Howlett